Be Wealthy and Smart, episode 162. into a world of wealth and financial freedom without budgets, boredom, or bosses on Be Wealthy and Smart. And now, here's your host, Linda P. Jones. Welcome to Be Wealthy and Smart. I'm Linda P. Jones, America's Wealth Mentor, empowering women and men worldwide to financial freedom. Before we get into today's interview, I just want to mention our sponsor, Jason Hartman of the Creating Wealth Podcast. It's a must listen for anyone who is looking to create additional revenue streams. His show is full of smart stuff. And if you like this show, you'll like that one too. And today I'm really excited to have Jason Myers, co-founder and CEO of the CXO Collective on the show. Hi, Jason. How are you doing today? I'm great, Linda. How are you? Fantastic. I'm so excited to have you on the show. I so admire. Thank you. I so admire the work that you do, and you're such a bright mind in the entrepreneurial space. I was so excited to get you here today and talking about entrepreneurship. My crazy schedule actually worked out. So. Oh, my goodness. You are traveling more than anyone I know. Boy, you are everywhere. I yeah. am. <laughs> Back and forth, East Coast, West Coast, yeah, everywhere, international. So, Jason, tell us about CXO Collective. What is that? Sure. So, uh, CXO Collective um, is a new version of a private equity firm. Um, What we've done is we've put a a real focus on human capital. Um, When I started investing in small companies, um, basically as an angel investor, um, started seeing kind of the the way the system works and started uh, getting to um, interact with people in the private equity space, the venture capital space, the, the hedge fund space, and seeing really what's broken with all of that. And um, I met my co-founder at a, at a speaking uh, assignment. Uh, we were both working at a conference and we were in the speaker's room and he was coming from private equity a partner in a private equity firm and I said you guys you guys have it all wrong it's all messed up and this is what's wrong with uh, putting capital into small companies and medium sized companies and he goes you're absolutely right he goes if I had the cure for that it'd be a different world and uh, we kept talking because I I told him I've got the cure for that and um it focuses on human capital. So what we did with CXO was uh, we started CXO to focus on uh, attracting human capital t- to the organization, create a very large uh, talent bench, if you will, that's that's wide and. So we've got people from all types of uh, industry sectors, all types of areas of specialization in those sectors, and all kinds of geography. And what that gives us, it gives us a huge talent bench that as we find opportunities to get involved in companies, we can actually go through a very structured process of looking at that company f- for what it is and for where uh, the entrepreneur sees it can go and chart a course there knowing that we have this talent pool to be able to pull from to help us get it there. Because one of the biggest challenges that businesses have is that they have good ideas, but they don't actually have the talent on the team to execute those ideas. They don't have the person who's been there, done that. They don't have the person that understands the mistakes that are made along the way. And so um, by us attracting that talent into our organization, it allows us to mitigate a lot of execution risk with those companies. And we put that ahead of capital, uh, meaning financial capital, because you can have an idea um, and you can get money for that idea, but the very next thing that you're going to do with that money is start to deploy human capital. And I have found in my time that that's where a lot of the mistakes happen. You pick the wrong person for the wrong assignment or, or what have you. Mm-hmm. So you're bringing in those people to help with businesses that you've invested in? 
Yeah, so what we do is um, we practice something that I picked up along the way called uh, aces in their places. And so it's about evaluating the, the talent, evaluating the situation with the company, creating <clears throat> a plan that is both strategic um, and and very tactically focused so that you you can go through and uh, chart this course and say we've got a resource gap. So a great example I like to use is we'll be talking to a, a business owner um, who's got a successful business but they're looking to grow and they're looking for some amount of money and we ask them what the use of proceeds for that money will be and they start outlining things and and invariably, like in the example that I like to use, they're going to hire a chief marketing officer. Great. <clears throat> Have you ever hired a chief marketing officer? <laughs> the answer to that is almost always no. Um, so then you wouldn't know a good one from a bad one, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. And so what you're going to do is you're going to use my money, our money, to go hire somebody for a position that you don't know if they're actually a good candidate for that position or not. So you're going to roll the dice and you're going to select this candidate. And it is rolling of the dice. It is a gamble. And um, there's a chance you're going to get it right. There are more chances that you're going to get it wrong. And <clears throat> so what we do is uh, change their thinking a little bit to um, bringing in resources like a CMO who is a known quantity, somebody who's proven, somebody who has a track record, somebody who understands the entrepreneurial journey, um, and then deploying them into the organization uh, to create that marketing program hire those uh, marketing resources, contract with the right companies that they've had good experience with that have delivered on their promises. And basically, uh, it shortcuts the path to success because when you've been around the mountain before and you've already uh, found the path, uh, you're the one that knows how to get there more efficiently. Yeah, and that's a difficult thing to find the right people and with the right experience and you can just place them in there and that probably just shortcuts the whole system where they can really have success a lot quicker. Yeah. So you look at it and you go, well, man, if I, if I could just get the right person in here, we'd be off to the races. Well, that's the whole challenge is getting the right person in there. And when it comes to investor capital, um, you know, the plan's got to make sense and you're buying into the management team that's in place. But when you write them the check, what you're doing is you're basically putting your faith in them that they can spend that money wisely. Uh, which means if they're hiring people, that they're going to hire the right people. And typically there's a, a pattern there where they haven't hired the right people along the way. And that's one of the reasons they're not as far ahead as where they could be. Face it, very few people are great at hiring talent. And uh, it is a science and an art. And one of the things we do is we, we run all of our people through an assessment process so that we understand the dimensions and the facets to their uh, personality and the way they like to work and how they like to be managed and how they uh, perform under stress and all that kind of stuff. It's pretty comprehensive. Depending on the individual, it could be 70 to 90 pages of information that we get from that process. And it allows us to make sure we've got a good fit, not just for the assignment, but for their um, place in the organization, meaning interacting with the, the founder, the owner, um, the key people, all that kind of stuff. But getting the right people is important because it allows you to, to fill the execution gaps that you have when you create your plan. Um, but we run all the companies through a very structured process so that we can drive for a higher level of, of execution. So it's all you, about the people. It do, always is. Do you have a stable then of people that are already marketing experts, or are you going out and finding the marketing expert? Um, we do have a, a stable of marketing experts. Um, we've got people that are experts in supply chain, procurement, finance, uh, you know, all the areas of specialization. If we don't have uh, someone who is both a good fit and available for whatever uh, need 
comes up, um, our people obviously know people, and then we will um, reach out and, and bring them through our process. But essentially, it's a it's a big, talented organization with, um, you know, we have almost 300 now in the organization, somewhere between 270 and 300, and, uh, or, you know, growing all the time. Mm-hmm. And it allows us to take a look at deals and all kinds of um, uh, different parts of the um, business industry of everything from software to manufacturing, retail, service, everything. So it's almost like one big mastermind where, where people can really help each other network. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's it's interesting because really what we've done, and I think the, the term gets thrown around a lot, but, you know, crowdsourcing, right, um, and crowdfunding and all of this kind of stuff. But really what we've done is we've, we've crowdsourced our ability to attract um, deals, you know, investment deals into um, our horizon, and then we've we've crowdsourced the um, talent uh, acquisition for those organizations, and we've crowdsourced the the funding because essentially what we really are is a large um, group of of angel investors. Also, so what will happen is we'll get a a deal uh, that'll come through the system. We'll evaluate that deal. Um, if it looks good, um, the members will start talking about it amongst themselves. We'll put a plan together for how to get that company, you know, to the next level, uh, create a, a win-win for, for everybody involved. And uh, human capital starts getting deployed. Financial capital starts flowing towards that company, and we're off to the races. This almost sounds like Shark Tank on steroids. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, it's interesting. Somebody was mentioning that to me uh, the other day, and I hear it from time to time, and I usually will turn around and say, well, it's not so much venture capital, although, you know, there are some deals that are structured that way, um, where at their earlier stage, uh, you're looking for a high flyer, you, you can have a high burnout rate. It's less that. Uh, and it's more uh, of a of a private equity um, and a super angel scenario where it's later stage where they they've proven that they can generate cash flow. Um, there's there's revenue coming in. They're struggling to grow to the next level, whatever that level is. And so what we're doing is more like what um, Marcus Lemonis does on the profit, except there isn't one of us. There's you know nearly three hundred of us. Interesting. Well, let's back up and tell people how you got in this position to be an angel investor. I'm sure people are wondering, how did you get here and what's your backstory? Yeah, so uh, I've been an entrepreneur my whole, really, my seems like my whole life. But uh, my first brick and mortar business was when I was 16. I had always uh, been interested in video games like a lot of kids are, and um, uh, I opened an arcade, and it started uh, making money, you know. At 16 you did this? At at 16, yeah. Oh, my goodness. Well, your parents must have helped. Um, they gave me the go ahead. They didn't. They didn't help because they were they were working, you know, eighty hours a week. And I mean, didn't they and, have to sign leases and things that only that minors can't do? Well, <laughs> I, I had my had my ways of getting stuff done, oh. but um, <laughs> it was it was interesting because in the span of having the idea to having the um, the location up and going, you know, was about a span of a week. And um, uh, fast forward a little bit of time, it, it was uh, very successful at attracting um, you know, customers, if you will. And they, they were dumping their piggy banks into these machines, and I was making money you know, hand over fist. And um, it, was, it was a great um, first real entrepreneurial endeavor. And um, I even had a friend whose father owned a video rental store in town who wanted to open an arcade. He actually had like, I think, one or two video. He might have had a, a video game and a pinball machine, but he uh, wanted to expand his business, uh, actually do an addition onto the business, and he was going to uh, use that addition for uh, opening of an arcade. And so he actually um, retained my services as a consultant 
and here I was a kid as a consultant, oh. but huh. consulting with him how to attract, you know, the youth of, of the area into that business uh, so that it would be successful. And it, it became the place that kind of everybody was hanging out. And uh, it did eat into my uh, velocity a little bit, but uh, anyway, so that's how I started. And I went on to do a lot of other um, entrepreneurial things. And I, um, you know, had some success and had some failures and learned from the, the failures of things and um, became a, a hired gun uh, turnaround expert in the wireless telecom industry and uh, worked on the carrier side, turning around sales teams and um, territories, um, technical teams, operational teams, all that kind of stuff. And just started uh, helping with uh, mergers and acquisitions. We were in the heyday of wireless. We were doing a lot of um, negotiating with other carriers to swap uh, operating licenses and territories and sales channels and different things. And um, so I got to, to see big deals uh, at a large scale with them. Um, I was on the the team that uh, did the largest merger in history, the AT&T singular merger, and um, just got to really see a lot of interesting things along the way, work with the best consulting firms, um, all of the big ones, the Booz Allens, McKenzie's, PwC's, all of that stuff, and um, saw how they worked, uh, how they uh, tried to help companies and, and where their systems worked and where they didn't work as well or, or had trouble uh, getting traction within the organizations and developed my own stuff along the way to really help uh, the business succeed. You know, I made, made a name for myself as being the, the guy that you could call at 4.30 in the afternoon. He'd be on a plane the next morning and things would be turned around in a matter of you know weeks or, or whatnot. And um, all along the way uh, was making, you know, extra money and putting that money into different uh, businesses, different ideas, different things, and seeing and watching those those grow or, or have trouble and then helping them navigate through the trouble. But the one thing that I learned along the way is, you know, if I had a, an entrepreneur come to me and they had a great idea and it all made sense and got me excited and I wrote a check and I let them go about their business, uh, their, their business seemed to be, uh, through no real fault of their own, seemed to be to just light my money on fire. And um, I learned that's not the way to do it. Meaning burn it up and... (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. uh yeah. And so um, what I I realized, and it's funny how we all learn things that we actually know, but we just don't apply them, is that when you put uh, some money into uh, an endeavor, if you can tap into your own unique genius, your own talent, and bring that to the table as an advisor, kind of in a... um, uh, you know that advisory capacity where you're you're just helping them to execute the plan that they've articulated in whatever way and and maybe it's a small way but whatever way you can help for some reason it seems to go better than just writing blind checks and so fast forward all this time to the creation of CXO collective essentially what I've done is is created uh, a larger version of what I was doing individually, which is, hey, this is a great idea. Let's um, let's find out more. Let's help you get the plan to be very tight, very crisp. Let's figure out who you need on the team to make it happen, and then let's line up the money to pull that off. Interesting. So, what do you think holds most businesses back? Uh, failure to execute. Failure to execute their plan, or, or yeah. Mm-hmm. So if they have a plan, that they're not executing it at a high level. Um, if they don't have a plan, which it's amazing how many of them don't actually have a plan. They just believe that they're in this business, and if they if they build it, they will come. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a <clears throat> it's one of the symptoms of founders itis. <laughs> um, is, is to believe that what you have people will buy mm-hmm. and to not really have a plan to make sure that's true. And so what I spend a lot of my time doing, and it's, it's the area that I enjoy the most in my, in my business, is helping those businesses figure out what the real plan is. 
uh, strategically, like the direction, look, where are we going, why, what's, what's in it for everybody, how strong is our conviction to that, and then what do we need to do to start making strides in that direction, and what's holding us back, and how do we fill the gap. Mm-hmm. And you and I were talking recently about how it's actually how people think and their mindset that can be something that holds them back. Yeah, it's it, it's amazing. So you can have the the best laid plan, and at the end of the day, it comes down to the people. The people are the ones that have to execute the plan, and we all live our lives, which means that at any given moment, we're getting stimuli, we're getting input that may or may not help us with that mission, right? And so you can you can be on your way to work and get tangled up with somebody that's got road rage and they can ruin your entire day. And you can lose an entire day of productivity over just being bent out of shape about something that in the grand scheme of things doesn't matter. And so you let these things veer you off course and, and before you know it, Um, a little bit here and a little bit there, you wake up one day and you're pretty far off course. And execution in business is much like that, where it may not feel like you're off course just yet, but there's this cumulative additive effect that occurs. And so having um, some perspective and being able to um, have feedback mechanisms baked into the business so that you know sooner rather than later if things are going well, if the people on the team are accomplishing really what they need to be accomplishing, if they're plugged in, you know, or if their, uh, you know, their level of conviction is as high as it needs to be. And um, face it, we're all going to work hard. Um, the question is whether we're working smart. Mm-hmm. So what advice do you have for creating a good plan that is executable and and people can find success with um so this is this is where some of my thinking may diverge from most people and this is from having done it hundreds and hundreds of times over the last you know know, over 20 years now is that you actually need uh, someone to facilitate you through the process of creating the plan. It's very difficult for a group of, of folks. And if you use a small business as an example and you say, okay, we've got a founder or we've got a pair of founders and we've got a right-hand person and whatever, get those people in a room and it's the same Information, the same bones that they're chewing on, the same baggage that they're carrying, the same perspective that they brought into the room, all of that comes into a room and a stew is created out of all of those ingredients. And that stew really doesn't taste any different than all of the stuff before it. And so what you have to do is you have to you have to go through a a process of getting very, very real raw, honest about what it is you're setting out to accomplish. Like, where are you currently in reality? Not where do you think you are, but where are you really? And a lot of times we're so myopic with how we look at the business that we're not able to um, see it for what it actually is. And the first, the first step is understanding reality. And the second step is understanding the dream And then the third step is charting the course between the reality and the dream. Because where you are is not where you want to be. And where you are is a direct reflection of everything that you've done up to this point. And so I like to say that, uh, you know, they... That old saying of uh, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over, expecting different results. Mm -hmm. I like to flip it around and say that if you want to accomplish things you've never accomplished before, you need to do things you've never done before in ways you've never done them before. Mm, that's really that's a tweetable quote <laughs> yeah yeah so um that's what you've got to do in that process and it and it's very hard for a, a doctor to perform surgery on themselves it's very hard for um you know someone to even have good balanced perspective on their own business. Mm -hmm. And so I'll even tell people that work for a company, maybe they're a a director, an upper level manager, vice president or whatever, that that 
they may think that it is their role to bring their people in and run through a strategy planning session. They may think that that is their job. That is, that is their chance to be on the soapbox. That's their chance to lead. And that is the first of many flawed assumptions and, fl- and flawed uh, notions. And so um, their job is to harness all of the talent available at their disposal to come out the other side with a, a plan that's the best plan that they've rallied the troops behind, that everybody's in it to win it. That's their job. And what that means is harnessing all of the available talent at their disposal is means pulling people in to help, uh, to help um, translate, to help articulate, and, and to help speculate about what, what can and should happen and to stimulate the dialogue. Because you know how it is. You get together with your, your three friends because, face it, you know, you're, you're in business. You're working with the same people all the time. You spend a lot of time there. They're like family. They're like friends. You get in the room with three of your friends, and it's the same jokes. It's the same <laughs> routine, right? Unless somebody brings something, you know, some bombshell to the table, it's kind of the same thing over and over again, which is one of the reasons you like it. <laughs> right. <laughs> but in business if you want different results you have to you have to put a different ingredient into the mix. And 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 much like concrete, you know, concrete is made out of sand and gravel and stuff, right? But then there's the other part that they put in there that actually makes it harden. And um, you need that other piece so that you can come out the other side with hard concrete instead of a pile of sand and gravel. Mm. There's so many things in there I want to talk about. Hi, it's Linda here, just breaking in to let you know I divided this interview into two parts so that you could hear part one and part two. Wait till you hear what Jason has to say in the next interview. Thank you for listening to Be Wealthy and Smart with Linda P. Jones. Share the wealth and tell your family and friends about the show. Check out our website, blog, and social media for more riches at www.bewealthyandsmart.com.